I'm Tony Dungy, and uh, we are today really blessed to have a, a round table on college football and minority hiring. Uh, we did this before the Super Bowl with some NFL people, and it was really instructive and uh, helpful. And today we're joined by Tyrone Willingham, a former head coach at Stanford and Notre Dame and University of Washington, and also by Mike Loxley, who is former head coach at University of New Mexico and now at University of Maryland. And so I'm excited to have you guys with us. Thanks for joining us. And I'd like to maybe just open up and uh, start with you, Tyrone, and then go to Mike. Just talk about your views on the current state of minority hiring, diversity, development in NCAA football. I'm very familiar with the NFL, uh, not as familiar with college football. I'd love to get your take on it and then go to Mike. Uh, first of all, Tony, thank you for letting me be a part of this panel. Um, when you retire, you kind of move to the background and you're not quite as aware of all of the circumstances as you'd like to be. Uh, but I guess that my first word would be disappointing. Uh, you would think that we would be at a point, and I said this some time ago, when we've been through the system and the system being the universities, okay, where we've had integration, student athletes have passed through almost every university in this country. You would think that we know all the nuances of those universities and the demographics of all of the people that we would have to work with. And if that is the case, if we have the understanding, if we have the skill level, why don't we show it in the hirings? So my word of disappointment is um, probably uh, underscored in terms of what the feeling should be at this time for where we're at. Mike, how would you describe it? You know, I, I got to echo, and again, I appreciate you, Coach, for uh, having me on this panel uh, with, with you and, and Coach Willingham, who I have so much respect for, uh, the jobs that you guys have done to open up the doors for opportunities like this. Uh, but I, I share the sentiment of disappointment. You know, uh, at the start of this season, we had 14 minority coaches in college football, and we lost three, and, and, and you know, we're down to 11. And so... I feel really disappointed and, and, you know, I started this organization, the, Co the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches, uh, during the pandemic as I took a quality control, as we all know what quality control is in, in the game of football, as to what I wanted to be known for and, and where we were in this profession. And I thought back to what you talked about the first time I had an opportunity to be a head coach at the University of New Mexico uh, in 2009. And at that point, we had got up to as many as 18 in college football. And to look back and 11 years later, uh, the number drops to 14, continues to be disappointment. And then to look at the way the cycle went this year, uh, dropping us down to 11, when you continue to see the amount of uh, minorities that are playing this game, uh, and, and then us with not having these opportunities to lead programs, which I think if we ever you know, would like to see this change, we just got to continue to keep talking about it. And that's what this panel is all about. So I appreciate you for having this panel. Yeah. And, and I guess I'd, I'd like to maybe explore uh, how we got here. I would echo the word disappointment, too. Uh, I'm disappointed in minority hiring in the National Football League, but everyone says, well, OK, that's 32 owners and everybody's trying to uh, make a profit and they're running their team the way they want to. But you think uh, or maybe I'll ask this question. Wouldn't you think in college football when we're supposed to be exemplifying other ideals and we're trying to be the leadership in the country that it would look a little different on college campuses maybe than the NFL. How, how would you guys respond to that? Uh, Tony, I'm going to jump on that with both feet if you don't mind. Uh, my problem is if there is talent, then we should attract talent. And what we're saying is that, excuse me, <clears throat> is that obviously there is a disregard for African-American or people of color talent. Because as I said earlier, we've gone through the universities, we've received, received the degrees, okay? We are smart, we are intelligent, we are knowledgeable. Many of us have played the game at the highest level. And yet, when you say, I wanna make my team the best, then those that are in the hiring positions are turning their back on talent. And to me, that, that's contrary to the game itself. 
So I, I have a, a real strong um, disappointment, and I'm going to keep using that word, with the state of where we are right now based on the talent level available and to the uh, precedent that we want to set by being winning programs. Okay, if I'm turning my back on talent, I wouldn't turn it on a great quarterback. Okay, I'd recruit him. I want him to be a part of my system. And yet we have coaches, African American, minority coaches, people of color that have talent and can lead programs and be successful. And we're, we're, we're turning our back on them. Yeah, and again, I say the same thing, Coach, uh, from the standpoint, I, I equate it to almost the parallel of what the black quarterback or the minority quarterback had to go through. And now when you turn on the television and you watch high level teams are being led by minority quarterbacks, uh, we're in the same situation from a coaching standpoint. We just got to be able to kick the door down, uh, do a great job. As I said, you know, they're not hiring coaches anymore. They're, they're electing them. It's almost like we have to campaign, uh, you know, every time Kirk Herbstreit, you know, says a name of a, a hot assistant that echoes and it builds. And so I think we've got to do a great job. And that's one of the things I want to do with the coalition is campaign and do the promotion part. You know, when Nick Saban gave me the keys to the offense at Alabama and the success I was able to have being able to run a program like Alabama on the offensive side, it opened up so many doors. And so somehow, some way we have got to continue to put those names out of all these assistant coaches that are doing bang up jobs. You know, we have enough qualified candidates in the college football pool to be able to fill some of these. And we just need the opportunity and we got to, we got to promote it and we got to campaign our tails off to make sure that it's not just a two month conversation, December and January when these jobs open, but a 12 month conversation and, and the campaign starts today. Yeah. I'd well, love I, to I ask you guys. Tony, can I, Tony, go before ahead. you go Sorry. to that, Okay, because see, I, I, I love that, Mike, that we are being a part of the campaign, but it shouldn't be a part of a campaign. If I am a AD and I want to surround my program with talent, then I am constantly on the lookout for those people that have the skills necessary to help my program win and be successful. So it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't have to result to a campaign. It should be about me as an athletic director, me as a university president, me as great alumni that want a, a great athletic program, keeping my eye alert to those people that have talent. I do it in my businesses, or at least they say they do. So why doesn't it apply to us? I agree, but that campaign is about a great story. They want to be able mm -hmm. to justify why and that's where we've got to do everything we can to give them the narrative and the story as to why this minority candidate is the right candidate. And I, I think that's the part from the campaign. You're, I agree 100% with you. We shouldn't mm -hmm. have to, but it makes it a lot easier to make that decision when, as they feel like they're putting their necks on the line when there's a story to justify why this hire was made. And that's what I want to be able to do with the coalition for not just two months out of the year, but 12 months mm -hmm. out of the year. Well, that's one of the things I was going to ask. Um, I know in the NFL, yes, it's winning and losing and you want to win a Super Bowl. But me looking at college football from the outside, there's one other factor in that college football head coach, and that is the notoriety for the university. Uh, I couldn't really tell you who the president of the University of Alabama is or uh, the, the <laughs> chancellor at uh, you know, uh, Clemson but I can tell you who the head coach is at Alabama and the head coach at Clemson. And that person almost becomes the face of the university. So do you think that is, and Mike talked about having to tell a story and a sales job. Do we have to get our African-American coaches to promote themselves, to become uh, palatable, to be the face of a university? Go ahead, Mike. It's hard to it's hard to campaign for yourself. Uh, you know, that third right. party validation uh, is really, really important, just like it is in the recruiting process. When you have someone outside coming in to say what a great program that is, that's what I call third party validation. And I think 
that's exactly what I feel we need to be able to do. And that's what these conversations need to be. And that's what panels such as this should be all about is being the third party validation to, to campaign or to put these qualified individuals names out there in the forefront so that they can't say that they didn't know we had guys that were capable. Well, I, I, Tony, to that, to that, I would say that you, you're darned if you do and darned if you don't, okay? If you don't push yourself, uh, then no one hears about you. If you do push yourself, well, you know, this is not really the guy we want. He's all about himself, okay? And when you attach color to that, especially in our present day society, it is problematic. Mm. Now, what, what role do we, and I'm going to put myself in the media now, what, what role do we have to play and how can we help and what should we be doing? I, I would think that as, as Mike spoke to a second ago, you become a third party. Uh, the media becomes that voice for someone that shouldn't be his own voice. If we are aware that there are great candidates out there, then their name should be mentioned. Uh, just like a uh, Herb Street or somebody else does when he finds out there's a great candidate somewhere. And please understand, I don't think anything that we're saying in our conversation is to, to diminish uh, the talents of any other coach. But the fact is that we are underserved and we should be served better is why we're speaking along these lines. Agree. Um, you know, from a media standpoint, we we've definitely taken the approach that it's our job to figure out how to get these names and not just in front of the media uh, coach, but also in front of these search firms that have their list. Uh, and I can tell you that with the college hiring cycle this year, uh, the coalition was really active and engaged with search firms, presidents, ADs, uh, and the media part to me is just as important. And it just can't be black media or minority media. We have to have it coming from everybody because until it's a, important to everyone, you know, it, it doesn't get the needle moved in the right direction, which is why, you know, when you look at the people that I put in on the board with the coalition, it's not just a bunch of people that look like me, but some really successful individuals who aren't of color, the Nick Sabins, the Debbie Yiles, Desiree Reed, Francois, those type of individuals. When it comes from the other side of it, and not just from our media or the minority media that, that follow us, I think it has that much more impact and that's where that campaigning comes into play to make sure that these names are coming out of the mouths of the talking heads that we we have every saturday to talk about college football yeah yeah well um i i have become one of those talking heads and i i've seen <laughs> firsthand how powerful that can be uh we were broadcasting a notre dame game and i just happened to say on there hey if you're an athletic director, uh, Clark Lee, the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, I think he's tremendous. I've watched them all year. I would want my son to play for him. And you know, the next day, an athletic director called me. Uh, and that's what can happen. Um, and, and I think you're right. We need to be telling those stories and we need to find people that can tell stories about these uh, very, very good and very, very capable African-American coaches as well. One comment there, if, if you don't mind, uh, you are a trusted voice. And that is a whole world different from a lot of the media voices that you have. OK, and th that is critical because I think when they look at minority candidates, they want to know, is it coming from a trusted voice? OK, or are we just throwing out another black candidate? Okay, so yeah. that becomes another element of it that is very critical. Yeah. I, I want to go back to, to 1995. You and I <laughs> were together on the Minnesota Vikings staff, and I have, I've become frustrated here in the last few years because I have recommended some coaches, black and white coaches, to people mm -hmm. who I knew very well. Uh, 2006, uh, my alma mater, the University of Minnesota, was looking for a new coach. And I called the athletic director and I said, I had a guy on my staff. He's the defensive coordinator in your town right now in Minneapolis, Mike Tomlin, <laughs> and he's sensational. Mm -hmm. And my AD said, I could not do that. I couldn't hire someone who hasn't been a head coach. Well, mm -hmm. six weeks later, he's the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
and I'm a frustrated <laughs> alum at that point. But I did the same thing. Scott Frost, my son played for Scott Frost at Oregon. And I mm -hmm. fell in love with Coach Frost. And I called some people and I called some power five people and said, hey, this guy is really, really good. You're looking for a head coach. You ought to hire him and got the same response. Well, no, we couldn't do it because he hasn't been a head coach before. Our alums wouldn't put up with that. He ends up going to University of Central Florida, smaller school, and goes undefeated. And then he becomes a hot commodity. But does that process of having to be a head coach first, uh, that's got to be a hindrance to, to minority coaches, I would think. Um, when, you, when you're not wanted, you have to check every box to get an opportunity. The alumni, in many cases, and it's not all the alumni, I would probably classify it as which alumni, what alumni, okay, is kind of in control and makes that decision that we can't hire because he's not a head coach. So I, I, um, I, I also share that frust frustration, but I was very lucky. Uh, you talk about going back to 1995. Um, Ted Leland was the athletic director at Stanford. Uh, I had been, he was there uh, as the AD when I was an assistant coach with Denny Green and Denny Green was the head coach. And we also had a unique situation that there was Dr. Condoleezza Rice uh, was also in the administrative office, I believe at that time as the provost. And therefore there were voices in the administration that said, look, didn't necessarily say hire, but they said, look, so therefore the playing field was available to a coach that had not been a head coach, but that uh, had a wonderful reputation, reputation with, okay, the administration, the student athletes and the alumni community. Yeah, I, I think again, you know, that lack of being a head coach uh, in the hiring process is what leads us to, to take tough jobs. I can tell you, I took a, a very <laughs> tough job at the University of New Mexico because I'd interviewed for four or five head coaching jobs and that kept coming up. And so when I was able to take a job, I took a job that it was a, a good job, a tough one. You know, we had been, they were under some NCAA penalties, but here's what I'll tell you, coach. Um, I think there's another market of coaches out there because I failed miserably, as you know, at, at New Mexico the first time. And I am so much better a coach the second time around. I always say it's like having kids, that first one, you can read all the baby books you want to read about how to deal with the first kid and then it's all reaction. But when that second one comes, it's the experience. And so I think there's a, there's two different markets of coaches, ones that haven't been head coaches before, that if you're just given a chance to get on the dance floor, and that's all we ask for. I mean, that's I think that's what we should fight for. That's what we should be campaigning for, just the opportunity to get in front of whoever it is and you know in the college game we, we serve a lot of masters because there you it's like recruiting you have to find who the champion is who's really the person making a decision and and that's a lot of homework involved to find out who that is and then that's where the storytelling the validation the third party validation the narrative of why this guy even though he doesn't have the head coaching experience is the right guy and how that story can justify the hire because it always comes down to optics when it comes to making this decision, especially in a college game. And, and so, mm -hmm. but then I also will tell you that the flip side is there's a lot of head coaches, minority coaches that have failed or not had great success the first time around. And I promise you, I, I feel so much more comfortable sitting in this seat here, uh, driving the Maryland program mm -hmm. than I could ever have when I took the job at New Mexico. And New Mexico was a great experience for me. Yeah. Well, I'd li like to ask you that question, though, Mike. What do you think was the most beneficial for you in your career, uh, going to New Mexico for a couple of years and not winning or going to Alabama and being the offensive coordinator at a monster program, a, a winning program? I, I promise you, and I've said this before and people look at me, uh, the, the losing and the, the lack of success I had at New Mexico when I always talk about quality controlling, it gave me more, uh, more uh, information, more education 
than I ever could possibly get from the success I had at Alabama. Now, that's not to discredit what I learned at Alabama because I took quite a few things from an organization, from structure, working with probably one of the greatest college coaches, if not greatest coaches in the business. But the experience that New Mexico offered me uh, was way more valuable to me as I sit as the head coach here at Maryland than what I learned at, at, at Alabama as an offensive coordinator winning. Mm -hmm. Ty, I'd like, like to go back to your career because I, I know a little bit about it too. You were very, very successful at Stanford and had a situation where you probably could have stayed there 20 years and, and been just fine, but you decided to move on and go to Notre Dame. And it wasn't just uh, for personal reasons. I, I'd love for you to share uh, maybe a couple <laughs> of your reasons why you ended up going to Notre Dame from Stanford. Well, and, and this is not to uh, diminish either program one way or the other, but uh, obviously Notre Dame has an unbelievable history, an unbelievable tradition, and is a great place uh, to coach and a great place to be at. Uh, Stanford is uh, like no other place uh, that values the student athlete. So those two experiences were both wonderful, but I am, and I am extremely proud to say this, I am a black man and I wouldn't want to be anything else. And because of that, I had wonderful parents that taught me it was important to give back. So in going to Notre Dame, one of my reasons was that this could be a move to help us, to help African-Americans. Uh, because at that time when I left, I thought in my mind there were two other African-Americans that had enough resume to get that job at Notre Dame. One was our host today, Tony Dungy, okay? And the other one was Denny Green. I thought those were the two African-Americans at that time that had a chance to get that job. And the two of you had other things in your, in, in your sites that you were not gonna be a part of that, I don't think. So uh, for me to go and be there was a step to move us forward. and. Um, that was part of my thinking. And the other part is it is such a, a wonderful tradition. And I remember going back to um, a guy that I hold dear in my life, uh, Jimmy Ray. Uh, Jimmy Ray played in that 1966 game with Michigan State and Notre Dame. And as a kid, somehow that was in the back of my mind and that kind of helped me get to uh, Michigan State and also kind of parallel that relationship with Notre Dame. Well, you make you guys both make a great point, and I'm curious. And I'll start with you, Mike, and then go to Tyrone. How do we get to the point where we can, as African Americans, get those type of jobs? How can we get? What what advice would you give a young African American coach who wants to climb the ladder and would like to end up at Alabama or Notre Dame or Michigan or Ohio State? What do we have to do? to get in that pipeline? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna put the onus on me just like Coach Willingham did when he described why he took the job for us. It's really important for the 11 guys that get to sit in the chair that are minorities uh, for us to be successful. We have to win to be able to pay it forward. Uh, the advice I would give a young locks coming up in the business is to make decisions and moves that will help push you to where you want to be. Meaning I had to be very deliberate after I got let go at New Mexico with every decision I made. I mean, I made a decision to go from being a coordinator, a guy that had been a coordinator or a head coach for 15 years, to going to be an off the field analyst for Nick Saban and, and what we call his rehabilitation center. And it was <laughs> the best move I ever made. It was the best decision I ever made because it allowed me to align myself with successful, a successful person and program like Coach Saban. And I think too many times we make moves or decisions as young coaches for money or for prestige or to get a title when unfortunately you have to align yourself with great successful people like you guys did with Denny Green and Bill Walsh. And you look at how a lot of the, the, the coaching trees work. I, I would strongly suggest to the young locks coming up in this business, find a way to get yourself into a big time program 
or, or around a successful program or coach and get underneath that umbrella, learn, pay attention, work for the job you have and not for the one you want. Mm -hmm. Mike, I, I think you've hit it right on the head. Um, I think you do have to align yourself with successful people. Uh, but I would add to that successful people that have values. Because as we know in our profession, there's some people that don't have values. And for me, my mental process was a little bit different. I wanted to just simply be the best coach I could be. I didn't worry about being a head coach. Okay. I said to myself, if it happens, it happens. But the one thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to be the best coach on the field that day. Okay. No matter what program I was in, that was my goal. Now you have to understand the competition was, ooh, was really rich at the Minnesota Vikings. Okay. Cause I got Dungey on one side. I got Brian Billick on the other side. I got Denny Green as the head coach. I mean, there's some other people and I haven't even named that it was tough. So, but I wanted to be the best coach on that team every day. And that's what I work for. Tyrone, I want to ask you this uh, and, and go back and talk about Stanford. You mentioned it in the atmosphere there. Uh, there aren't too many programs in the country that have been great spots for African-American head coaches, but Stanford has. Denny Green flourished there. You had a very good run there. David Shaw has now been there for a decade and doing well. <laughs> Why is Stanford different than almost every other school that we've seen in terms of opportunity for minority head coaches? I, I think if I'll go back to um, when Denny was there, and Denny was directly under Bill Walsh at that time, had been uh, with him at Stanford, with him with the um, 49ers, and I think Bill was not afraid of color. And therefore, his administration and his contacts in the Bay Area allowed him to voice those type of opinions to people in that community. So Stanford became a place that didn't mind Denny Green. And when Denny Green left, they didn't mind after Bill had been the head coach, bringing Tyrone Willingham back. And then they didn't mind later hiring David Shaw. And I think that uh, mixture of Bill, and again, I mentioned uh, Dr. Condoleezza Rice, uh, being in the administration, you had people that said, we will take a look, okay? Doesn't mean we're hired, but we will give an opportunity and an audience to people that we think, regardless of color, are qualified and have the talent to do the job. Mike, I'm gonna ask, start with you and then go to Tyrone. Um, hypothetical question. You've got a young 25 year old, brilliant football mind and he wants to someday be the head coach at a power five school. Can he go in the NFL direction and learn from some great people? You talk about surrounding yourself uh, with good people, quality people. Can you go to the NFL, uh, take in that information and come back to college or is it easier or better to work your way through the college system if you're a young minority coach? Man, that's a tough one because the, the <laughs> way I see it, Coach, uh, you know, obviously the one thing that I've seen and I've never had the opportunity uh, to coach at the, the National Football, in the National Football League, but what I found from the young coaches that have come up through my day and age, you know, the Pep Hamiltons is that, you know, once they get into that NFL, it's hard to get them out because the quality of life and the lack of having to recruit where it's just mm -hmm. football 24 seven makes it a little different. So I do think it takes a, a little bit of a different skill set. You know, everybody knows. And, and, and I made my mark initially as a guy that they knew could go get players from a recruiting, a recruiting standpoint. And the ability to recruit is huge in the college game. And if you don't have the experience of, of, of being on the pavement and knocking down doors and finding champions and, you know, selling the program, uh, you don't have that skill set. Sometimes it, it makes it tough to come back. Now, I'm not saying you can't go up to that level, come back as a head coach and then hire people to do those things. But I would say that it, it's a little difficult in what I've seen, the guys that have started at the NFL at a young age, 
it's tough for those guys to come back down and, and, and do the layman's work of, of uh, knocking on doors and chasing 18 to 22 year olds around uh, 365 days out of the year. Uh, I, Tony, I, I would agree with that. I, I think probably the most difficult aspect of it is maintaining the necessary contacts. Because the one thing we've said about college football is uh, the hiring is kind of disguised. OK, we look to the athletic director to do the hiring, but we know sometimes at some places, many alumni are kind of in charge of that. So to be able to main th maintain those contacts necessary to get into the system, to get that exposure, I think bef uh, when you're in the NFL becomes very difficult. Not impossible. I was going to ask you. But yeah, I was going to ask you guys that, too. Um, you know, how much of it moving up the ladder and getting to that head coaching position is, as you say, knowing the landscape and who the champion is at these universities and making yourself known to those people. Uh, obviously, that's a big part of it because it seems to be that's where we're falling short. Well, I, I for one, think it is very difficult, but I also think you, you have to be careful as a coach because I don't think any head coach wants an assistant on his staff that's a phone guy. OK, yeah. and you guys kind of know what I'm talking about. That guy is kind of way. Hold it. Wait a minute now. We got a job here. OK, so I, I think that is a difficult um, uh, balancing act that that a coach has to do in, in order to maintain those contacts. Yeah, I would say this, coach, you know, in, in order to not be that guy, that's the phone guy <laughs> or working the system behind the scenes to make sure you, you're known where you are. It goes back to what Coach Willingham talked about being the best coach that you could possibly be at that at that university, because you know if you work for a good guy, and I, you know Ron Zook gave me an opportunity to be a coordinator at Illinois, and the job he's a defensive head coach. I ran the offense, and we went to the Rose Bowl after three years there. The job I did, and the way Coach Zook put it out there of what the type of job I was doing is what helped build those relationships. And though I didn't necessarily know those people, they knew who I was based on the job that I did. So I would go back to what Coach Willingham talked about, being the best version of yourself as a coach, letting your work speak for you as a young assistant or as an assistant that's given uh, a little bit of uh, you know, power as a coordinator or as a quarterback coach or whatever your job is. And if your position group plays really well, people start asking who's coaching them. And so I, I, I would take that approach for sure. Yes. Mike, I want to ask you a little bit more about this coalition. Uh, what kind of, in your mind, sparked it? What is it exactly you would like to see it do? And, you know, what is the, the reason we needed it? Well, first of all, what sparked it was this pandemic. I can remember March 12th leaving our morning workout and when this first thing happened about COVID-19 and nobody really knew what it was and, and told our team that, hey, we're probably gonna have an extra week of spring break and we never came back until June. It allowed me to have pause in my life, which very rarely as a coach do you ever have an opportunity to pause. And it just so happened my wife was stuck down in Florida with my daughter. So I'm here in this area by myself at the house for almost a month and a half. And as I was taking my walk, I, I, I basically had an epiphany like, I mean, what do I want to be known for? And as I told people, it basically came down that my give a crap gauge was on E. And I work for a black <laughs> athletic director here at Maryland and I have a black president here at Maryland. And this is the richest minority area in the world, this DC area, the DMV area, which I grew up in. And, and as I did an inventory or the quality control of where I was as a coach, and I feel like I'm, I'm now, I turned 50 last year, so I feel like I'm on the back nine of my career. I started asking myself, what can I do? And I just thought back, I was a BCA member. I was a young coach when Coach Thompson and, and, and Coach Willingham and, and Noah, Nolan Richardson and all those guys created the BCA. And it was our voice and now it's, it's gone. And so there isn't a, a voice. Now in the one area that I thought maybe we went a little wrong with the BCA in my opinion is that we tried to be all things to all people and I wanted to be really laser focused on just football. 
in minority coaches in football. And so I remember picking up the phone and Mike Tomlin and I came in this business around the same time. And I called Mike T and said, look, Mike, I said, I'm thinking about doing something. I want to create an organization similar to what the BCA was for us to pay forward uh, opportunities and especially the experience I've had a failed head coach that was fired that now has a chance to run a program as a minority a second time is not not normal and so Mike T jumped in with both feet uh, I reached out and told coach Saban look I'm one of the few black branches off your tree I think what you did by giving me that 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 rope to pull me out uh, is something you should be you should be a part of and he thought that it was a great idea. And so I just continued to reach out through my Rolodex of all the people that played a major role in helping me get back to where I am today. And I said, I wanna pay it forward. And so the, the, the objective of the coalition is to prepare, promote, and produce. We wanna prepare the next generation of coaches with all the tools they're gonna to need uh, to put themselves in position to be head coaches. We wanna promote, which goes back to that campaign that I'm gonna keep talking about because you know, that goalpost continues to shift and move. You, you got to call plays, and then a guy gets hired who doesn't call plays. You got to be a quarterback <laughs> coach, and then the receiver coach gets the job. And so we've got to stay in front. And I, I use the Stacey Abrams campaign uh, agenda as kind of we've got to be that. The coalition has to be that uh, for 12 months out of the year so that it's not just when those two months of the hiring cycle happens that we do everything we can to promote the bang up job that the minority coaches in this country are doing uh, at all levels. And then the last piece is to produce, is to come up, uh, especially with the, the, the experience we have on our board to vet quality candidates. We're using analytics because numbers don't lie. Uh, we've got to show the hires, the, 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 the hiring uh, people, the benefit of being and hiring diversity and how it affects the bottom line and it makes sense and that's C-E-N-T-S, not S-E-N-S-E. -E. And that uh, <laughs> people don't understand that the hiring and diversity uh, allows you to, to, to be profitable, more, more profitable than what they know. So we're, we're going to use every measure, and especially the analytics piece, because numbers don't lie of how and why hiring minority coaches is beneficial to whether it's the NFL, college, or, or at the high school level. Awesome. Well, you guys have been great. I have one last question for you. I'll go to Tyrone first and then to Mike. Five years from now, in 2006, or excuse me, 2026, we're sitting here, we're at this round table again. What will progress look like for you? We say we're disappointed now with 11 African-American coaches. What will progress look like and what do we have to do to get that done? Um, Tony, I'm, um, I don't know if I can directly answer that question uh, because I'm one of those that believe there's getting ready to be an upheaval. Um, and I think the upheaval is going to take place with the student athletes. I think the fact that we're going to have uh, or some point we're going to move towards some kind of unionization or something along those lines is going to really turn this whole thing upside down. And the reason I say that is because if you go back to when we were in school, Tony, in the 70s, we had the situation with women, okay? And the power to be refused to listen to the women. And all of a sudden, Title IX came along and everybody lost control and it's not exactly what it should have been or could have been. It could have been so much better. And I see right now the powers that be are doing very similar, the same thing. They're not listening. They're not paying attention, okay? And all of a sudden the system is gonna get turned upside down and I think this one would be done by the student athletes. So if I were to say five years from now, what would success be? I don't know the number, but I would like to have an opportunity for minority candidates to genuinely have an opportunity to show their wares. And if we could get that, then I think the numbers would uh, jump yeah. dramatically because I think the quality of the coaching uh, is tremendous. OK, so I, I don't have a number. Key, is there one key element or one key thing we need to do to get those opportunities uh, to, to be more available? I, I would I would still go back to the student athlete because I think that's where the power is. OK, the power is in the players. And unfortunately, 
you know, it, it's going to take some type of turnaround in them that's going to force the change in the system. Mike? Yeah, for me, it, it, here's what progress would look like for me in five years, Coach. And I'll start. The first piece is, is when there are people other than Tony Dungy, Tyrone Willingham, and Mike Loxley's faces that are talking about this, that are talking about minority coaches in the same light that we are, because it can't be just us. It's going to take all of us. And so, you know, you sit back and you, you very rarely hear NFL owners talking about the importance of diversity. You, you don't hear a lot of, you know, college presidents, athletic directors coming out, speaking to that same, uh, speaking that same language. So it, we need them. And in five years, if we have people championing for us, which is what I'm trying to do with this coalition and with the people that I have on board, Bill Polian, Nick Saban, uh, guys like that championing for us and being that third party validation. And then I, I have a, a simple formula that I use here with our team. When you want to measure success, I say success is equal to production being greater or equal to expectation. And so the expectation is we've got to, we've got to be better. They've got to do better. And I do agree with Tyrone that the student athletes going to play a major role. I watch it and see what Dion's doing at Jackson State and the, the campaigning that's going on there. I'd love for all the top players to come play for me and help me. You know, it's a race. There's never <laughs> been a black head coach. There's never been a black head coach win a national championship in college, yeah. coach. I know you won it in the in the NFL, but uh, I'd love to have those guys come play for old Coach Locks over here in Maryland. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you yeah. what, guys, thank you. This has been informative. It's been awesome. I appreciate the insight and the honesty. And uh, we just have to keep keep plugging and going forward. And we, we have to keep hitting these decision makers and let them know, hey, your teams can be better. Uh, I wrote a letter to, to our owners and said basically the same thing. Hey, there was a time we didn't have any black players and we thought the game was good. And then we got diverse players and the game got better. Then we didn't think <laughs> they could play quarterback. And you know what? We let them play quarterback and the game got better. And we didn't have head coaches. And then all of a sudden we've got coaches winning Super Bowls and the game gets better. So that's what I think our athletic directors, our alumni, everybody has to understand. We just want to make the game better. Yes. And all those things <laughs> made sense too. <laughs> Every last one of the, the minority quarterback winning makes more money. Hiring Coach Dungey yeah. winning Super makes more money. So we got to keep pushing, keep knocking on the door. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thanks for the insight. Tony, thank you. Thank you, Coach. <laughs>